Welcome to the Superintendent's Hangout, where we discuss topics in education, charter schools, life in general, and not necessarily in that order. I'm your host, Dr. Sharetta. Come on in and hang out. In this episode, I was privileged and honored to sit down for a conversation with Pedro Noguera. Dr. Noguera is Dean of the USC Rossier School of Education. He has served in that role since 2020. Originally trained as a sociologist, Dr. Noguera's research focuses on the ways in which schools are influenced by social and economic conditions, as well as by demographic trends in local, regional, and global contexts. He's the author of 13 books and over 250 research articles in academic journals, as well as book chapters, edited volumes, research reports, and editorials in major newspapers. Dr. Nogueira serves on the boards of numerous national and local organizations, including the Economic Policy Institute, the National Equity Project, and The Nation. He's a regular commentator on educational issues on national media outlets, and his editorials on educational issues have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Dallas Morning News, and the Los Angeles Times. Dr. Nguera and I touch on a wide range of topics, including student discipline approaches, the role of student suspensions, the limits on that role as well, equity in education, understanding the need for connection between schools and students, and much, much more. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did sitting down with Dr. Noguera. Welcome, Dr. Noguera. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Superintendent's Hangout. Great to be with you, David. Um, I'd like to begin the conversation uh, where I start with all guests, um, which is with your origin story. Um, you know, that's a question that I stole from Terry Gross, but the best interviewer ever, uh, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm a New Yorker originally from Brooklyn. Um, you know, I often say that, uh, I grew up in the part of Brooklyn that still hasn't gentrified, uh, New Yorkers will know Brownsville, yeah. uh, better known for producing, uh, boxers like Mike Tyson than professors like me. Uh, my family uh, was uh, immigrant, working class, immigrants from the Caribbean. Um, but my parents really believed in education. And uh, somehow all six of us uh, went to uh, top ranked colleges, um, which says a lot about um, their values, their uh, beliefs in education. And th- that definitely something um, I took from them. So um, I was a first generation college student. Um, Went to uh, Brown University, where initially felt like an imposter, like many first-generation students do. Felt like I didn't belong. Um, Surrounded by really wealthy people. Uh, One of my classmates, who I got to know well, was a guy named John F. Kennedy Jr., uh, Mm -hmm. who some of the listeners may have heard of. (laughs) And um, it was in knowing people like that that I uh, got over this idea that I belong because I started to see them just as regular people uh, with their own challenges, uh, though different than mine. Mine were primarily financial and social, theirs were others. Um, But that experience left me questioning why so few people like me, that is students of color from low income backgrounds were in schools like that. And that actually is what drove me and my interest in education. Um, I started teaching while I was in Providence. Um, That's where I first started teaching at Central High School, which was considered the worst high school in the city at the time. Um, But I I wasn't committed yet to education. I I went off to Berkeley where I pursued a PhD in sociology. But while at Berkeley, um, I decided to uh, teach in the Oakland Public Schools. And so continued on my education pathway. And the more I taught, the more I started to see this as a really uh, important work. And and what drew me to education was how tangible it was. That is, that that you could really affect the lives of people through teaching. Um, And it's that belief 
that led me into education that keeps me inspired about the work I do today. Thank you. Thank you for that. I detected the New York accent in you. Uh, I'm also a New Yorker, but from the from the, the other side of the Hudson River, what probably you probably what you think of as upstate New York, but Rock- right. we call everything uh, Yonkers beyond is all upstate. Upstate, yeah. So I grew up in Rockland County, uh, okay. so that's definitely uh, upstate. That's Although for we you, to go there to, that's, to ride New York. Yeah, that, that's right. Exactly. So it's up there. So um, how did you kind of resist the siren song of perhaps going into professions that would be historically more um, would be better paid, for example. I mean, you were you were clearly rubbing shoulders with uh, if you if you rubbed shoulders with JFK Jr. and his and the, and his ilk, uh, that that kind of class of society weren't educators, right? They didn't come from families. How did you resist that siren call of like MBA, uh, JD, uh, whatever medical school, whatever those paths are? Well, you know, it's funny because uh, my father, who didn't have uh, even a high school diploma, um, told me before I went off to school, he said, um, you know, you can get a free education with a library card. Mm. And he, he did that. He was an avid reader. Uh, he said, so now since you have this opportunity to go to this elite school, I hope you won't study something that you could have studied for free in a library. So uh, when he found out I was studying sociology and history, he said, you could have done that in the library. <laughs> he, he wanted me to be an engineer or a doctor. Right. But, um, and for initially I was thinking about um, medicine as a career, but um, what, and that was largely because I wanted to do something that would help people. Um, I my turn out, you know, my math and science wasn't my strongest, those weren't my strongest subjects. Um, I was drawn to history and sociology, but then when I took a, a psychology course in education, um, uh, I was immediately, it clicked immediately. I, I was asked to work with a kindergarten teacher um, and to help her, uh, who was, she was struggling with some uh, behavior challenges among some boys. And I immediately saw that the only challenge was that these boys were restless um, and um, needed to be engaged. And I knew that um, they were likely to be in trouble all the time if uh, because this teacher couldn't handle them and had already kind of labeled them as problem students. And it was in working with these young men, these boys, um, that I started to see both the problem and the potential. Um, the problem, as I see it, is that schools are fixated on control, controlling kids, and the kids they can't control, they label or they get rid of or they track into oblivion um, and um, the kids they can control are the ones who um, are often do are more successful. Um, I, I realized that, that, that the real answer was in building relationships with kids, getting them engaged, getting them excited about learning. Um, and I felt that we, I, I wanted to make sure that that work um, uh, was happening because I saw it as something very tangible could change lives. I was touched by an anecdote, and I think it's both in one of your books as well as in a, in, a, in an article. Um, I think it's in the the problem with black boys, and also an article on uh, school discipline or the the school to prison pipeline, uh, where you were visiting a campus and a an assistant principal was telling you about a student. I hope I get this right. The stu a student who was misbehaving when you were doing a, a walkabout on the campus. And this guy says to you, hey, you know what? There's a cell in San Quentin waiting for this guy. And you said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, his dad's in prison and his his uncle's in prison, et cetera. And, I'm, and then you, you kind of shock us in your book and you go, yeah, that was an African-American educator who's saying that. What uh, <laughs> obstacles have you faced in your work uh, and your research, or have you seen in your research around the preconceived notions that society has, regardless of what race we are in society, of, of when looking at, uh, at at black boys, for example, black boys and men? Yeah, so to go back to that um, example I shared, um, this was a, a, a little boy, he was only about seven or eight years old, who was acting out in class a lot, was difficult and disruptive, but he also... Um, and, the, and the assistant principal shared this with me. He had a father in prison, a brother in prison, and was being raised by a sick grandmother. And the school was ready to suspend him. 
And the mm -hmm. question I posed to the assistant principal is, what is the school doing to keep him out of prison? And he didn't have an answer because he didn't think that was his job. See, and that's the problem, right? Um, we, we talk a lot about the school to prison pipeline. It's partially a metaphor, but it's not really a metaphor because when you, and you look at who's in our nation's prisons, um, what you see is that we are more likely to incarcerate people we fail to educate. Um, we are most likely to incarcerate black males. Um, and the problems facing black males don't start in prison, they usually start in school. They start in schools that, where there are no, where the relationships are strained, um, where they're bored or um, not, their, their learning needs aren't met, um, or the other needs they bring don't get addressed, whether those needs are hunger or lack of housing or lack of support at home. Um, and, in, and in most schools, we're most likely to punish the kids with the greatest needs, um, and those often are Black boys. So part of what I try to do in a lot of my work is to draw attention to the ways in which um, certain kids are written off as uneducable, um, and that has implications for the race and class of kids. Um, um, and and to, to, to really remind educators that we're that's not our mission. We're, our job is to help kids. Our, our, our mission is to use education to improve lives. And um, when you are more concerned about addressing the behavior, but then addressing the cause of the behavior problem, you end up pushing kids right out of school as this assistant principal is doing. So um, <clears throat> black boys are experiencing this kind of punitive approach to discipline um, in a lot of schools across the country. It's not simply white administrators doing it. As I used an example, this was a black man. It's about the way the system works. And it's only when we are reflective about our role in that system and, and start to understand um, how we may be complicit in that school to prison pipeline that we can disrupt it. We've seen coming out of COVID, um, you know, I, I don't know if this has been measured, but certainly kind of reading the tea leaves in the media, there's been this kind of uh, reverting back to calls for more punitive discipline uh, in schools. And as uh, educators have said, oh, you know, kids were out of school for a year and a half, two years, and they, they, they didn't, you know, they don't know how to do school anymore. So now we need zero tolerance policies. Um, we've got that end of the spectrum. We've got restorative practices, uh, perhaps on the, on the other end of the spectrum. Um, uh, where do you see uh, practices such as suspension, uh, uh, if at all, in schools, uh, their usefulness, their utility? So, you know, I'm a realist. Uh, I'm a former teacher. So I know a teacher cannot teach in a disorderly classroom, um, schools which have to be safe um, and orderly. Uh, no one can, you know, no one does is served by disorder, by chaos. At the same time, what I also know is that suspension should be used as the last resort, not the first resort. Um, and, and if you just think about it for a moment, you know, uh, why would we think that kids who don't like school, that their behavior would change by denying them learning time, by sending them home to play video games? Um, and uh, this is, in effect, what schools do. And that's because I would argue that the goal is not to change the behavior. The goal is to get rid of the kids. Um, if the goal were to change the behavior, we'd have to get more creative. We'd have to think about our, uh, the kids in school when we think about our own children at home. Um, if my child, one of my kids, acts out and does something wrong, I don't say, get out of the house. I say, give me your cell phone. Um, no, right. no internet access. I take away privileges. And then I try to address what's behind the problem and, and really deal with that, talk about that with, the, with, with one of my kids. And I would say this, that's the same thing that we've got to do in school. We've got to figure out, we have kids who are acting out. Uh, are they acting out because of mental health issues and need a counselor to help them? Are they acting out because of neglect at home? Are they acting out because they're bullied or threatened? You know, we need to know um, why if we're going to um, thoughtfully come up with a way to address it, because the goal of discipline should be to change the behavior. Um, and you can only do that if you know what the problem is and if you know how to re-engage those kids 
um, in school and in learning. And um, that's where I think a lot of schools struggle. They don't know how to do that. And they go, they, they revert to just a policy that says, if this happens, you could, here's the, Get rid of them. Here, here's the flow chart for suspension, expulsion, et cetera. I have a colleague who works with restorative practices in San Diego County. And she says that she always says that uh, we all want restorative practices for our own kids, but for ourselves. We, <laughs> or for ourselves. I mean, I, and I, 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 it doesn't make me real popular in my job, but I'll have personnel all day long who say, you know, I've used up all my sick leave, but I had to take these extra days. And, you know, my grandmother lives in another state and I'm thinking to myself, you're the same person who a week ago is punishing a kid because they turned in their homework a day late. And they told you that they're, you know, they're, they're something happened and they, they that's why they're delayed. But you, you have a zero tolerance for that, but then you expect me to, to uh, be flexible with you and you're an adult and you choose to work here. Uh, it's an interesting, it's interesting. Um, I reflect a lot on that fact of if we would look at our, the students who are in our charge or in our, in our care, in our daily, in our professions, the same way as we look at our own biological children or the people we love and care about in our private lives, I think the system would be, have different outcomes perhaps. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, um, you know, Again, this doesn't mean we want schools to tolerate misbehavior. You know, I think sometimes people hear it and they ask, well, then what are we going to do? Because, they, you know, again, we've, it's, it's rooted in traditions. And, and the tradition is that you get rid of kids. You, we exclude them um, when they act out. And that, like, as you said, if we were thinking about our own children or ourselves, we wouldn't want to be treated that way. And, and so the alternative is you you come up with you first you figure out what's what's going on and if and if discipline is needed and I'm not against there being consequences I think a lot of times they do need the punishments need to match the offense you know so a child who's not doing their work how about Saturday school how about you don't get to play recess you stay in the office with me and get your work done right more work not less work right um, because I think we send the wrong message to kids if we say the punishment for acting up is go home and watch TV. I could go a whole bunch of different directions on this. One of the things that keeps popping in my head and it's not totally connected to that thought, but I was very moved in your description of your son. I think if I'm, I, Joaquin, I think is his yeah, name, Joaquin. if I get that right, uh, that you noticed a stage in his life, I think as a, it's somewhere in his teen years where his demeanor shifted uh, and he became, defensive and, and really, I don't know, maybe for lack of a better term, sullen, uh, at least in his interactions with the world. Can you talk about uh, how you unpacked that and w why you included that in your, in your book? And also, um, I think it's, it's in the book, uh, the problem with black boys, although I've been yeah. binging your book, so they, I, they're overlapping for me. Um, uh, why you included that and what instructive pieces that has for educators uh, across the spectrum? Yeah, that, that paper is called Joaquin's Dilemma. And okay. Joaquin's my oldest son. He's actually a professor now uh, of education at um, Loyola Marymount University. So it's ironic that uh, yeah. I wrote about him. But I wrote about him because I think what was happening with him is typical of what happens with a lot of boys, um, particularly Black and Latino boys. Um, Joaquin had been doing fine in school, but as he entered high school, he started developing what I would kind of describes the oppositional attitude. Uh, and that showed up at home and showed up at school and his grades plummeted and um, he was getting in trouble and I didn't understand it. But instead of simply pushing him away, I tried to spend time with him to really understand what was happening with him. And one of the things I started to learn is that although he came from a middle-class family, by then I was a professor, um, he was, his peer group, the group he identified with were kids on our block, most of whom were, came from families that were struggling. And he was saying to me, you know, you think I'm doing bad, but in comparison to my friends, I'm doing good because I'm not failing. And, um, and I was trying to understand, well, why are you comparing yourselves to them? Why don't you just do your best? But that's the way, you know, adolescents, are very much influenced by their peers. And, and the peer group you identify with um, has a lot of 
bearing on, you know, your attitudes towards school and towards lots of other things. Um, you know, he was lucky because by 11th grade, he got a, a new girlfriend who was a great student and <laughs> put him on a different path and ended up, you know, doing fine. But, uh, you know, a lot of kids don't have um, parents who know how to talk to them, don't have an adult, a mentor around who can figure out how to get them engaged. Um, and so I, I used my son's experience because although things worked out for him, there are a lot of kids out there um, who get written off and who get lost because uh, our schools aren't organized to provide the kind of support they need. I want to talk a little bit about, about role models and examples in society. Um, you write that, uh, you know, we've got many examples of athletes and entertainers uh, who, who, who are black men. Um, you know, you turn on any sitcom, it seems like on TV, there's, you're going to see uh, a people of color, um, but you're not seeing examples of uh, college deans or, uh, you know, uh, we could fill in any other prestigious position, politicians or, or what have you. Um, how can educators uh, like myself and the folks in my organization and the listeners on this podcast work to kind of shift to shift that that paradigm? Um, you you talk about Joaquin looking at his comparative field. Uh, he's got he you're seeing him struggling, but he's looking here and he's like, I'm way above these guys. But and he had you as an example, and obviously he's followed in your footsteps. Um, uh, but how do we as educators work through that and, and help better support our boys, especially? You know, mentorship is critical. And um, especially be when, when boys don't have uh, a father present in the home, then having an adult male, um, preferably somebody of their background that they can connect with, um, is really helpful because what it does is it lets them know uh, that the first of all they're cared for, but also what's possible for them. So, um, you know, I often say that some of the best mentors can be, uh, you know, recent graduates of a high school who are now in college. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because even though they're not that much older, they know what those kids are going through. And the experience of someone from your neighborhood, from your school, who is now in college and doing well is very powerful for kids. Um, it sets a, a, um, an example that um, other kids can aspire to. If you bring in somebody like me, who's much older, um, you know, and and uh, uh, you know, a university professor, they will say, "Well, you know, that's too far out of reach. They can't even uh, understand a lot of times what someone like me does." Right. Uh, so, getting somebody who they can relate to. Um, both in terms of age and experience, I think can be very powerful. And um, it can help to demystify why college is important and and why they should consider that uh, a goal worth aspiring to. I want to return to the, the theme of school safety and discipline. Um, you know, we, we know that well, I wish it was an an, a, an ebb and a flow and another ebb, but it seems like the conversations around school safety and uh, protection against uh, school sh shootings have just kind of they they go along, but they never decrease. They're gonna they seem to be increasing. Um, you did an interesting, uh, fascinating uh, series of interviews with uh, over a hundred black students in LA Unified School District. You and I think a co-author um, where you. Uh, interviewed them and took oral histories around, I think their perceptions of interactions with school resource officers. Uh, I think a kind of a euphemism for a school police officer. Right. Um, talk to us about, about the findings of that study. And what struck me was this term of the legitimacy policing continuum. I was, yeah. I was struck, struck by that. And I'll, I'll just, I'll let you explain that. Yeah, we were, um, we were, did a study on on policing in in LA public schools, and we were because we'd seen the data. We knew not only were black students more likely to be suspended and expelled, they were also more likely to be arrested in school, and often 
for non-criminal offenses, right? Um, because uh, police get called in now for all kinds of things in schools, which is one of the reasons why there's been a push to get police removed from schools so that we have counselors responding rather than uh, police officers. Um, but what we, what we found is that the ways in which police are utilized in schools follows a pattern that's very similar to the way they get utilized in neighborhoods and communities. That is, um, that they are uh, seen as the uh, agents of control and um, that they are, um, that they use intimidation and fear as a way to, um, uh, of relating to, to, to kids. And, you know, we don't do see that in affluent middle-class communities, right? Where the police are seen there as being there to protect the kids, uh, not to control the kids. Um, and it's ironic because um, most of the school shootings that have occurred in this country have occurred in um, white, suburban and rural communities. Most of the perpetrators have been white males, um, but the, the, the zero tolerance, very punitive policies that have arisen um, because of the school shootings have become, are very punitive when they come to urban areas and uh, have resulted in um, this rise in arrest. Um, and so, you know, what we're trying to do there is to call attention to the in inequities and the injustice uh, again, schools must be safe, but we don't want to turn schools into prisons. Um, I try to remind people prisons are not safe places. Anybody's ever visited or knows anything about our prison system, they're some of the most violent institutions in the country. So why would we uh, hold prisons up as a, as a model that we want to replicate? Our schools need to be safe, nurturing places. Kids need to feel like they belong, because guess what? Belonging... Uh, is correlated with higher achievement, <laughs> better behavior. You know, um, the things that make a difference for creating uh, a, a safe school all are also related to creating schools where kids do better academically. And that's about the culture of the school and building a culture that engages kids and keeps them connected to each other and one to the things, adults. Yeah, one of the things that struck me from from uh, reading that that paper about that study was that a student talked about, or several students talked about this dynamic of a school resource officer counseling them and being friendly with them and, hey, you know, I want to help you. And then it moved along the path. And one student at least was like, yeah, next thing I knew I was, I was uh, on the ground getting handcuffed and, or something along those lines. Maybe I'm oversimplifying, but it was really a, it was that, that relationship that seemed to be very different from a relationship between a student and a teacher, right? You're never expecting your teacher to arrest you or detain you. School resource officer, uh, there's a friendship element or at least a feigned friendship. Maybe some of them are authentic, but then it can quickly move towards the law enforcement end. Do you see any role for school resource officers? Um, I in my work, I, I'm pushed all the time to hire them and implement them and security teams and security squads. And and I've pushed back on all of those, all of that, because um, I I don't believe that it makes the environment safer. I think if it, yeah. the safety doesn't come from within as human beings, we're, it's not coming from anywhere. But what, what's your opinion on, on that? You know, I, again, I'm a realist. And, um, you know, if the school's in an unsafe neighborhood, yeah, they probably need school safety officers to make sure that um, the kids are safe and that no one can just walk into a building. Um, and, and the truth is, because we have so many guns in this country, I, I, I'd say, you know, if the school shootings were committed by Al-Qaeda or some terrorist organization, the politicians would respond differently. But because right. they're committed by ordinary kids who just, or adults, who have guns, um, it seems acceptable. We just had a school shooting two already this year. Uh, yeah. and the year has just started, one recently in Iowa. Um, and no response from policymakers, none. Um, so it's, you know, we have to both challenge the way in which violence is normalized in American society, but then we also have to commit ourselves to uh, ensuring that the adults we bring in to keep schools safe do have strong, positive relationships with kids, have moral authority. Uh, I'll give you an example of what, what I mean by moral authority. Moral authority is not just 
your title, just the fact you have a uniform or a weapon. It is about the relationship, about um, how you're seen by the young people. So uh, a school I worked with in Oakland many years ago, uh, they hired a, a grandmother as their security guard, uh, mm -hmm. their school resource officer. And although she was in her 60s, she could keep anybody, you know, she could handle anybody who was out of line because she had moral authority. She wasn't there to intimidate. She was there to handle disruptions, um, whether it be from adults or kids, and, and it worked. So, it, you know, I think we, we have this image that the school resource officer needs to be a large man uh, who is armed. And in fact, I would say uh, what you really need is adults who know how to build strong relationships with kids. Because here's the truth. The, the truth is, kids, if kids trust you, they will let you know if there's going to be a fight or if another student has a weapon on them because they trust you because kids have an interest in safety too. They want to see safety. Uh, but if they don't trust you, they, they, the taboo against snitching is even stronger and they won't let you know what's going on. Yeah, and I, I think I would even extend that to the actual perpetrators oftentimes will drop many hints in advance. Just That's depends right. on whether we're, we're paying attention or not in the right ways. Yeah. Um, uh, I want to pivot a little bit to your work in higher education. Um, you know, you've, you've taught at very prestigious uh, institutions, Harvard and USC and others. How do you... <laughs> maintain your contact, your connection to equity and urban public education at a grassroots level, uh, and also operate at a, at a, I, don't know, I guess for lack of a better term, a rarefied uh, intellectual level. How do you bring those two together? So, you know, my work um, has always been focused on what I would describe as kind of pressing social problems. Um, so from the very beginning, when I was a new professor at Berkeley, I was concerned about issues of violence because violence was occurring in the community, particularly as related to um, the drug trade, the crack cocaine. Um, then I got concerned about problems facing black males because I was seeing those issues uh, playing out in schools. Um, that was in the early 90s. Um, and so right now, my focus on social problems can, uh, keeps me connected to schools here in Los Angeles where I live um, and, and keeps me thinking about, okay, how do I now as a dean of a school of education uh, ensure that our school is a resource for schools in the area? It should be that when schools are faced with problems and challenges, that they see the university as an ally that can help them figure out how to address those problems. Um, the metaphor I use a lot is the ed school should be like the med school, right? Mm. Great medical schools are attached to universities where they're doing research on healthcare. And that's why you want to go, if you're faced with a serious health issue, you want to go to a university hospital. Should be that universities with schools of education are also addressing compelling and important educational issues. And they help the schools um, through research and through practice is available at the university. Um, so that's what I aspire to, and that's the reason why I decided I would become a dean at USC. It seems that everywhere we look uh, in society and education in general, we we love acronyms. We love. I mean, I think the California Department of Education has an index of acronyms that's like seems like it's five hundred pages long. Right? It's just abbreviations and acronyms. We live by that. CRT, DEI, et cetera, et cetera. How can educational institutions think about concepts like diversity, equity, and inclusion in an authentic way uh, that's meaningful and not just, oh, we're, quote, unquote, doing this or, quote, unquote, we're doing critical race theory? Um, how, how can we, uh, as educators, make this work real, uh, tangible, uh, and meaningful? Yeah, well, uh, this is a big one because um, it's become such a controversial topic and you've got states now uh, <clears throat> banning DEI, banning critical race theory. Um, well, you know what they can't ban? They can't ban the truth. Um, and you can't hide from the truth of American history. And America has a 
a history that's um, you know fraught with injustice uh, that includes not just slavery but uh, genocide against Native Americans and um, you know um, every state in the country is required by law by the standards to teach American history. Uh, you had the state of Oklahoma um, under their ban tried to stop teach from teaching about the race massacre of 1923 in Tulsa. And even the court said, no, you can't deny kids the right to learn that. So some people may be troubled by um, American history, but the, the real issue is how do we ensure that teachers are equipped to teach that history in ways that um, help kids to understand it? Um, diversity is, is our future. Uh, this country is not gonna become less diverse. Uh, the irony is um, that if you look at the census, what you see is uh, the white population in this country is aging and shrinking. So what that means is that increasingly older white people will be tend be dependent on a younger, more diverse workforce to support them, right? And their old age. So older white people should be the biggest advocates of educating young people of color. Because if those young people of color don't have a good education, Social Security's in trouble, Medicaid's in trouble, all our support systems for that aging population, those baby boomers, um, is, is in trouble. So what we don't see is that we're interconnected, we're interdependent, right? And uh, education is key to our future. So um, what, I, what I try to do as I speak to um, around the country to policymakers or to educators is say, look, if people are put off by buzzwords like equity, um, then, then use something else. You know, one of, uh, you know, we, we prepare a lot of superintendents at USC. One of our alumni is superintendent of Newport Beach, uh, a wealthy community here in Southern California. And his board told him, we don't like the word equity. He says, okay, then from now on, we'll just talk about making sure we're educating all kids. I said, okay, we like that. Well, e equity is about educating all kids, regardless of their race and background. Um, and so let's, let's not allow the rhetoric uh, um, to get in the way of the substance of the work. The substance of the work is we need schools that serve all kinds of kids well. And we only know if that's the case if we see... Um, Predictable patterns of achievement are disrupted. Gaps in achievement are closing, right? Uh, we should see poor kids like myself who are excelling because guess what? I'm not the only kid who came from a working class background who has the ability to excel in school if provided the opportunity. Um, and that's what the work should be focused on is making sure that educators know how to do that work. I was watching a, a YouTube video of a speech you gave. I'm not sure what the setting was, but it seemed to be a, a group of teachers. I know you do a lot of these around the country. And you brought up uh, the, the term and it made the audience laugh, but you talked about uh, evidence-based versus faith-based teachers. Yeah. And everyone started laughing. I think there was some nervous laughter in the room. Can you explain, can you explain what, what that means? Yeah, I would say... <laughs> Hmm. when I talked about faith-based, you know, the biggest problem in a lot of, particularly middle and high school, is teachers focus on covering the material, covering the curriculum, rather than teaching the kids, right? Hmm. There's a difference. Um, when you teach with a focus on evidence, you teach differently. You are constantly checking for understanding. You're looking at student work to make sure that the students are getting it. If they're not getting it, you're reteaching and teaching differently. You're differentiating support. You're doing all the things we know to ensure that kids are learning, right? Because that's what, because I always say teaching and talking are not the same. Mm. Covering the material is about talking. Teaching is about the evidence of learning. So when I talk about faith-based teaching, it's, you know, like you cover the material and then you hope they got it. Oh. <laughs> you hope that the test scores will go up. That to me is, is pretty weak. We want evidence that they're learning every step, every day there should be some evidence of learning. Um, and you only know that evidence is if you look at the work the kids produce, you know? And, and so evidence-based teachers 
um, are, are holding themselves accountable for student learning. Um, and uh, I often say that good teaching is like good cooking, right? <laughs> How do you know a person's a good cook? Well, all the people who eat the food will tell you that was good. How do you know a person's a good teacher? The students will tell you. And right now, you can go to any school in this country and you ask the kids, who are the best teachers? They will tell you who are the teachers who are actually helping them to learn, right? And that's what we need to look at more closely. Who are those teachers? How do they work? Who are the teachers who can get kids to overcome fear of a subject, right? Um, who can get them to feel a sense of confidence and competence about what they're learning. We need to learn from those teachers. We need to demystify what that looks like because too often those teachers are isolated by themselves in the classroom yep. and no one's learning from them. Um, and right next door, there's a teacher who's struggling. And I think we, to extend that thinking, we have uh, many school site-based cultures that uh, actually discourage people from focusing on effective teachers, right? So they they don't, uh, you, we kind of have this idea that we're in a staff room even that we're, we're not going to even draw more attention to one teacher over another in terms of their success. Uh, we want to kind of keep it, oh, everybody's, everybody's a good teacher. Everybody's doing their thing, even though, as you say, you ask the kids and they'll tell you right away. It's like asking the kids who's the best dress teacher. They'll tell you right away, right? Uh, uh, but more importantly, they know which teachers they learn from, which ones they're challenged by. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it is important to create a, uh, an atmosphere in a school where teachers can collaborate, where they can work together and plan together. So you don't want to pit teachers against each other. Yeah. And, but you do want, you know, I would say if you bring the work into the room and you get teachers analyzing student work together, then the evidence is clear. Some teachers are producing better work out of their kids than others. And that's an opportunity for a conversation. You know, what are you doing to get your kids to uh, do such advanced work, to, 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 to engage complex text when my kids are struggling? Um, and when teachers have conversations and share, what can happen is that it can help all teachers to improve mm -hmm. because, um, too often, you know, we are asking teachers to do something really hard without enough guidance. You know, you think about what does it mean to be a good teacher? It means you have a strong command over the subject you're teaching. It means you have, you know how to teach it. You have pedagogical skills. You can teach in a variety of ways. And most importantly, it means you know how to build relationships with kids right. that are rooted in respect and trust. So kids feel safe with you. They feel challenged by you and they're willing to work with you. Although I, I've worked my entire career in charter schools, I kind of consider myself to be a, a bipartisan uh, observer and participant in the educational uh, landscape. Uh, so this podcast is certainly not focused exclusively on charter schools. Not, we haven't even mentioned it until now. Um, you wrote a fascinating book, uh, collaborated with uh, uh, Mr. Hess, I think, uh, on that was written in email form which was really interesting, right? It was your dialogue uh, yeah. around a range of topics around related to charter schools. Um, and I, I've, I again, had that on audiobook, and I would listen to it on my commute. Um, where do you see both the promise and also the challenge of charter schools in all these topics we've talked about, right? Um, innovations, uh, teacher effectiveness, uh, building strong relationships with um uh, our students, um, et cetera. Where's the promise and also perhaps the peril of charters? So, you know, the book you mentioned, The Search for Common Ground, we was charters just one of the controversies we addressed. We, mm -hmm. uh, we uh, Rick is a well-known conservative writer. Yeah. He invited me to engage in this dialogue with him about a number of controversies because we part of it, we wanted to demonstrate that we could actually engage in a civil debate, discussion over these topics, uh, because even before the current politicized and polarized moment we're in, there was a lot of polarization in education. And, and you know, there was the charter camp and the anti-charter camp. And um, so on that issue, you know, I, I have always taken a more nuanced view on it. Um, on the one hand, uh, I, I support schools that are good, whether they be charter, private, public, um, especially if they're good at serving um, kids who historically 
uh, haven't had access to good schools. <clears throat> At the same time, I am concerned that some charter schools screen out kids who have greater needs, whether those behavior needs or um, the kids whose parents don't even know um, that there's a lottery, don't know that they should get the kids signed up. So, you know, it's easier to serve the kids who need less help, right? right. <laughs> um, and so, and what we know is if charter schools can do that, then the public schools, the regular public schools are gonna have more kids who need more help. And that creates greater challenges. So um, I, I, my concern with, with the way charters often play out is that it exacerbates inequity in schools. Um, now, I also know of many charter schools that specialize in serving high need kids. Um, so you can't generalize about charter schools. Um, and, and I think um, some of the anti-charter folks do that often. So I, I think we have to understand what role charter schools play. Um, I think we should be focused a lot more on giving educators a chance to visit all kinds of schools, to learn from schools, because there's some great charter schools that public school educators could learn from um, if there weren't so much antagonism. And so part of the reason why uh, Rick and I did the book is to encourage educators to see the complexity of the issues rather than painting them in such dichotomous ways um, to open up a discussion rather than um, continuing this stagnant way of thinking about these issues, which I think has not helped us a whole lot. Yeah, I, I really appreciated that that particular portion of the book. And I think, regretfully, I think we're headed towards even more polarization in, in certain states. Uh, certainly, I can speak locally in San Diego and Southern California. And you're seeing, you know, declining uh, student populations uh, across the state. That means more competition, more competition for scarcer resources. Uh, there's going to be pressure, budget pressure. All those things, I think, lead to pointing more fingers rather than than reaching out to kind of find common ground. But I very much appreciated those those conversations that you had via email. Uh, one thing popped up in my head. Um, returning to the topic just for a minute. I, I knew I wanted to ask you this. I was thinking about it last night and I forgot to ask you when we were talking about the suspensions uh, topic. Um, have, have you done research or do you know of research that exists about the, uh, the degree to which schools uh, do what I would call kind of the soft suspension, soft expulsion? So we know as school officials, we have massive authority, right? I could, I could come in in my suit and tie and say, ma'am, you know what? It's just this school is not for your kid, you know, and and uh, you don't have an enfranchised parent. They might not speak, be speaking English, et cetera, et cetera. Add all those layers on. And before we know it, Johnny's going to a different school. Uh, has there been research done on that? And and does that enter into your thinking about exclusionary practice in schools? Yeah, the, you know, there's been certainly done research on um, in school suspension, right, which some schools use as an alternative to putting kids out, then they just set up a room where they put the kids right. <laughs> in school. Um, which if 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 it's not if it's done creatively and, and and that's a place where kids get counseled and get help and get put back, sent back to the classroom, that's fine. But if it just becomes a holding tank for kids, that's a real problem. Um, but we are also seeing um, what you've described. Now I haven't seen research on this, but you know, many of us have a hunch because uh, you can see it in the numbers. Um, and there was an expose on a, a well-known charter network in New York City, Success for All, where they actually, that's a principal with a gotta go list. And they were these were kids that they wanted to counsel out of school because they were frequently in trouble. And um, they were doing it. And it was a teacher who exposed it. Um, and, and it was very embarrassing for the network because they had taken great pride on, on their results. But all you had to do is look at their data. The number of kids entering the high school in ninth grade each year was shrinking. So that by mm -hmm. the time 12th grade, they had a very small number. So they could say, oh, yeah, we got 100% of these kids into college. I say, yeah, but you lost over half the class between ninth grade and 12th grade. So where did those kids go? And, um, you know, I'm sure not all of them were counseled out. Some of them just chose to leave. But 
you know, there's got to be accountability on on schools like that, um, that they don't just disregard and dis, uh, you know get rid of kids who are more challenging to serve. Yeah, I I was actually recently speaking with a um, young man who had graduated from our schools and then went gone on to college and started working at that network that you reference. And so uh, we were exchanging uh, YouTube videos of, uh, of different stories about the network. And it's interesting, uh, you know, certainly not the only place in America where there have been organized kind of conspiracies about kind of gaming the the systems around um you know how we're, how our student populations are are organized and who's in and who's out. I think when we, I think it was Charlie Munger, the the who recently passed away, he said that uh, I guess he's Warren Buffett's number two guy or whatever. He said, "You show me the incentives, I'll show you what the results are going to be." Uh, you know, whenever I see a board say uh, we're going to reduce suspensions and expulsions, uh, whatever. We have a goal to do it. I think <laughs> there's a right way and a wrong way to do that. There's a hard way and an easy way to do that. Yeah. Right? A fast way and a slow way. So uh, it's interesting. Um, you've been incredibly gracious with your time and I really want to honor that. I have one more question for you, but before we get there, is there anything that we haven't touched on uh, on the topics of equity and urban education and uh, these topics, perhaps some recent work that you're doing that you'd like to to highlight before I get to the last question? The one thing I would add is the importance of leadership. Um, you know, I've never been to a good school or a good district that didn't have a good leader. And good leader usually means they're willing to um, take on tough challenges. They're willing to generate a sense of shared responsibility for outcomes. They could they get buy-in amongst staff. They can communicate what they're doing um, to their staff and why and to the community. Um, and I just wrote a piece on implementing an equity agenda with my son, Joaquin, the same Joaquin we talked about earlier. And uh, and, and we talk a lot about leaders, leaders who are able to implement an equity agenda that serves all kids well. And so I would just, since this is your programs aimed at superintendents, I would just say that leaders who are able to uh, speak with clarity about their goals um, mm -hmm. are going to be the kind of leaders who are able to withstand the attacks that will come from those who oppose equity, as well as the attacks that come from parents who are tired of seeing their kids not get served. Mm -hmm. uh, because they're going to be, those leaders are, are going to be able to uh, produce results and be able to explain what they're doing and why. And I, I know some of those leaders, so I, I know they're out there. <laughs> And thank you for that. I And the challenge of seeing even just during COVID and the aftermath of COVID, the number of superintendents uh, taking early retirement, I'm sure not all of them were effective, but some of them were effective, right? Or leaving the profession, just too much pressure. Um, it'd be interesting to see what the next uh, generation of school leadership looks like into the future. Yeah. That That plus the challenges of, how AI ch changes our landscape um, and is already changing it. There's a lot on the horizon uh, yeah. at the school leadership end. Um, so my last question to you um, is a hypothetical. Um, you're given the opportunity to, to design a billboard uh, for the side of the freeway. I don't know, you said you're in LA, so I'm gonna call it the 405, but we know LA probably has more freeways than anywhere. So one of the freeways in LA, people are driving by, they're either going 70 or they're going seven, depending on what time of day it is. Um, what does your billboard say uh, to the world in terms of what, what, you, what you'd like to convey about the work you do and the beliefs you have? Um, it would say the future of this country Will be to, won't be determined by what happens in Washington. Mm. They'll be determined by what happens in our schools. Mm. Because our schools are producing the next generation of parents and voters, doctors, lawyers, teachers. That's, it's that important. So if you care about the future, you better care about education. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for listening to the Superintendent's Hangout. You can follow me on Twitter at DVS1970. Please be sure to share this show with friends and family on social media and in the real world. Thank you to Brad Bacchial for editing and production assistance and to Tina Royster for scheduling and logistics. Thanks for hanging out and have a great day. Thank you.